was laid to rest in Canton, Ohio, home of the Pro Football Hall of Fame. Okay, so he finally did not survive. He died and was buried in Canton, Ohio. He died on September 14, 1901. The president's assassin was Leon F. Zolgosh. Leon F. Zolgosh. Anyone here do a paper on him? Okay. Who was later electrocuted for the murder of President Kennedy. You want to, you want to add anything else about Leon Zolgosh? Yeah. What's that? Did I say, what did I say? Did I say Kennedy? Yeah. yeah. Kinley. Okay, yeah. Boy, I am getting crazy. So I will repeat that. The president's assassin was Leon F. Gold Zolgosh, who was later electrocuted for the, for the uh, murder of President McKinley. What else can you tell us about Zolgosh, Brian? Um, might be extra said, credit here. He said he did it for the people of the United States who get a code. For some reason, he killed the president because he thought it would be better for the people because he was. He was poor and he got fired when he was working in a factory and he felt like he was being treated unfairly because he was sending out a lot of money and that he was rich for being treated better and getting paid better and he got paid off from his job. Okay. So then he, he started uh, started losing faith in the church and once he lost faith in the church he started like talking to socialists and that's who the, he went to the speaking and that's who the lady was. She was kind of a socialist speaker. And then it just so happened that uh, the president was going to be there. And there you go. Yeah, he was very disgruntled. He felt that this was getting richer in the country. He went to this speaking meeting. He had to be in the right place at the right time and shot the president. Well, anyway, he was electrocuted for the murder of President McKinley. Vice President Theodore Roosevelt made his way to Buffalo shortly after the president had died. And he was sworn in as President of the United States, becoming the 26th President. Did they swear him in before McKinley died? No. no. But did he have control of the government before McKinley died? I mean, as long as McKinley could think rationally and make decisions, wounded, they would have allowed him to. But really, Roosevelt would be in charge of making <coughs> major decisions if McKinley couldn't. But certainly, they're not going to swear him in until after he died. Now, with his swearing in as the nation's 26th president, Roosevelt became the youngest man ever to hold the office of president of the United States at the age of 42. With his swearing in as president of the United States, Theodore Roosevelt becomes the youngest man in American history to this day even to serve as president of the United States. Who is the youngest man ever to be elected president of the United States? Who was it? John F. Kennedy. So John F. Kennedy was the youngest ever elected, Theodore Roosevelt the youngest ever to serve. Okay? Because he wasn't elected president, he, he succeeded. He was 42. 42. So Roosevelt becomes the youngest man ever to hold the office of the presidency at 42 years old. John Kennedy will be the youngest man ever elected president at 43. What day was he born in? I, I didn't give you that. The day, the day that he died, so I guess you could technically say it would have been the 14th of September of 1901. Now, not a lot of Republicans were happy that Theodore Roosevelt was the President of the United States. Sometimes they make these decisions to put people in this Vice Presidency to get them out of politics, not dreaming that maybe the President will be assassinated. So there were some Republicans who thought, oh boy, this is very good. Most people had actually nominated Roosevelt for the vice presidency to keep him out of active politics. So that's why he maybe was a little apprehensive to give up his governorship. But there were people that thought they didn't even like what he was doing as governor of New York, so they thought, well, we'll stick him in the vice presidency and he'll have even less power. Well, it turned out to be a little bit of a backfire. When Roosevelt was elected vice president in 1900, you don't have to write this down, one prominent Republican leader supposedly said, don't any of you realize that there is only one life between that madman and the White House? So he thought, this is a dumb move. You're going to put this guy in the vice presidency. Do you really understand that there's only one life between that madman, being Roosevelt, and the White House? All right, profile of Theodore Roosevelt. Say a little bit about him. 
interesting dude. Anybody do a paper on him in here? I think Gabe Durant was the only Theodore Roosevelt biographer. Okay, Theodore Roosevelt was born in New York City on October 27, 1858. He was born in New York City on October 27, <coughs> of 1858 and he was the second of four children that were born to Theodore and Martha Roosevelt so he really is Theodore Roosevelt JR yeah so he was the second of four children born to Theodore and Martha Roosevelt now Roosevelt's father was pretty well to do what does that mean if you're well to do got a lot of money he was a glass importer. He imported fine glass. And so the Roosevelt family was pretty well off financially during the time that Theodore Roosevelt grew up. So Roosevelt's father was a glass importer and his family was considered well to do. Well, when he was a young boy, Theodore Roosevelt was known for his great energy he was known for his curiosity and his determination, but his health wasn't that great. Okay, a young Theodore Roosevelt was known for his great energy, his great curiosity, and his great determination. But he suffered greatly from asthma, so he wasn't the healthiest, had asthma. And he was very, very nearsighted, which resulted in what in an early age? Glasses, which was a little unusual. I can relate to that because I had my first pair of glasses when I was six. So anyway, he was very nearsighted. He had asthma. And he was a little bit wimpy looking, to be quite frank with you. Okay, he was a little bit of a wimpy looking kid. Can you imagine a little, little kid with asthma with cross eyes and glasses and small? And his father did not want him to have problems later with bullying, I guess for the lack of a better term. And so his father believed he would need a strong body to give his mind a chance to fully develop and survive in society. His father was very much a believer in building up a strong body. And to give you an example of why his father believed that is because when he was 13 years old, Roosevelt was tormented by two boys and he felt ashamed because he was not strong enough to fight back. So in other words, in modern terms, when he was 13, this poor little tiny nearsighted nerd looking kid, for lack of a better term, got picked on at school. And he felt bad because he couldn't fight back because he wasn't strong enough to do so. So when he told his father about that situation, Roosevelt's father built him a gymnasium in the family home. Weights and the whole works. Not a gymnasium so much that we know now as a basketball gymnasium, but a gymnasium in those days that was a workout facility, so to speak. Kind of like the health club. A weight room and probably jump ropes and who knows what else. It wasn't a gymnasium for basketball. It was a gymnasium to work out and get stronger. Well, he overcame his asthma and he built up a pretty unusual physical strength for his size. Teddy Roosevelt in his later years was a tough old bird, very strong man. And it started when he was 13 when his dad said, you know what, this isn't going to happen anymore where you can't feel like you're going to fight back, you're too weak, I'm going to build you a gymnasium, we're going to train, and by God, you're going to be able to fight back if you need to. And he overcame asthma, and he had tremendous physical strength for his size throughout his life. Well, he goes to high school and graduates at the age of 18, and he goes to Harvard University in 1876. So he has a very good school career, elementary and high school, very bright. You don't get into Harvard if you're not bright. And he entered Harvard in 1876 at the age of 18. In October of 1879, he met a young lady by the name of Alice Lee. Alice Lee. And she was the daughter of a very wealthy Bostonian who owned his own investment firm. So more money meets more money, right? 
So he meets in October of 1879 Alice Lee. She is the daughter of a wealthy Bostonian who owned his own investment firm. And a year later, on Theodore's 22nd birthday, the couple were married. So he meets Alice Lee in October of 1879. Her father is from Boston, a wealthy investment firm <coughs> owner. A year later, on Theodore's 22nd birthday, Alice Lee and Theodore Roosevelt are married. You know, it's kind of interesting, maybe you'll get to this point. He graduates from Harvard University in 1880, and he doesn't, want, he doesn't really know what he's going to do with his life. I mean, you have a Harvard degree, and you're just not sure what you want to do with your life. He first went to Columbia University Law School, because he thought he might want to be a lawyer. But the courses didn't interest him. So he decided to enter politics. So he graduates from Harvard in 1880. He's not real sure what to do with his life. He first enrolls at Columbia University Law School with the thoughts of being a lawyer. But the courses really didn't interest him. So he drops out of Columbia University Law <coughs> School, joins the Republican Party, and decides he's going to go into politics. Well, in the fall of 1881, he was just 23 years old, he wins election to the New York State Assembly, which should be like what? Like the Wyoming House of Representatives, but not the big house. Remember I said Mike? career as a, sen a Wyoming senator at the lower level. They also have members of the assembly or house. So he's elected to the New York assembly, which is a lower level in New York. <coughs> Runs the state government rather than the federal government. And things were going pretty well for him until Valentine's Day, 1884. What day is that, by the way, boys? You should know that. February 14th. So uh, he, everything was going pretty well for Theodore Roosevelt until Valentine's Day, 1884. This is kind of sad. His wife died two days after giving birth to their daughter. On Valentine's Day, she dies. And that was two days after giving birth to a daughter. So on Valentine's Day of 1884, his wife dies two days after giving birth to a daughter, and his mother dies of typhoid fever on the same day. So he has a double tragedy on Valentine's Day of 1884 when his wife dies after giving birth to a daughter. His mother also died the same day of typhoid fever and they died in the same house a couple hours apart. That'd be tough, man. They died in the same house just a couple hours apart. Well, we left him what? depressed to say the least and so what he did after he lost his wife and his mother he left his daughter Alice in the care of his sister and he just simply left politics and had to get away and went to the American West he was very depressed he left his daughter Alice in the custody of his sister and just said I'm going west and he actually ran two cattle ranches on the Missouri River in the Dakota Territory. That's what he did. He had to get away. Terrible. That'd be a terrible thing for him. So he leaves his daughter with his sister, which probably wasn't unusual in those days, because I'll tell you, men had no idea how to take care of children in those days. The difference between my sons and how much they help their wives and how much I help my wife, I can't imagine was like way back then, because it's just a, it's a different game. You know what I mean? Well, anyway... He went to work for two different cattle ranches on the Missouri River in the Dakota Territory. And he became to be a very avid writer. He wrote two books. I have them both back there in that case. He wrote a, he wrote, excuse me, he wrote a biography on Senator Thomas Hart Benton. Remember him? Talk about Thomas Hart Benton of Missouri. He wrote a biography of Senator Thomas Hart Benton of Missouri. And he also wrote a four-volume series, that would be four books, that were entitled The Winning of 
the West. And I have both in my special cabinet back there. The, the four volume series, first edition, first printings are hard to find. So he wrote two different books. One was a single book, a biography of Senator Thomas Hart Benton of Missouri. And the other was a four volume series, which means there's four volumes, four books, entitled The Winning of the West. Well, on December 2nd of 1886, he remarried a lady by the name of Edith Carroll, who was a childhood friend. On December 2nd of 1886, Roosevelt remarries Edith Carroll, who was a childhood friend. And they had five children between the two of them, along with his own daughter, Alice. So they actually cared for six children. So Theodore Roosevelt and his new wife, Edith Carroll, had five children, along with raising his daughter, Alice, from the previous marriage. After his marriage, he resumed his political career, and he ran for mayor of New York City, but lost. So after his stint in the West, after he came back, he got remarried, he got back into politics, he resumed his political career, but he lost <coughs> in his race to become mayor of New York City. In 1888, he was appointed to the Civil Service Commission by President Harrison, and he was reappointed to that position by President Cleveland and served there until 1895. So in 1888, Roosevelt was appointed to the Civil Service Commission by President Harrison. He was reappointed when President Cleveland took over, which was a little unusual because you had two different... Uh, party presidents there, and he served in the Civil Service Commission until 1895. What is the Civil Service Commission? Anybody know what the Civil Service is? You're going to know when you turn 18 because you're going to have to, you're going to have to, you're going to have to register for the Selective Service. I think boys and girls, I don't know if girls have to know or not. But the Civil Service is what controls the military, you know, keeping the military with men, okay? Civil Service is serving your country, and it all starts with your registering through the Selective Service in case they have a draft and all that. Well, in 1895, after serving in the Civil Service Commission, he accepted the position of Board of Police Commissioners in New York City. In 1895, he accepted the position of Board of Police Commissioners in New York City. And the reason that he took the job is because there was a lot of dishonesty that was happening in the New York PD, and he went in there to clean it up, and he did. So in 1895, he accepted the position of a Board of Police Commissioners in New York City, and he fought very hard to stamp out the dishonesty that was going on in the police force there. And we know, so you can kind of just listen maybe here and not write, because you should know this, somehow he got to be Assistant Secretary of the Navy, did he not? Well, the, the reason he did that is because he campaigned vigorously for McKinley in 1896 through his support behind McKinley in 1896. And Roosevelt, for his efforts, was giving an appointment as, as Assistant Secretary of the Navy. So McKinley liked Roosevelt. And that's more than likely why, in a lot of ways, other than the fact they thought they might get him out of politics, that McKinley was willing to accept him as his vice presidential nominee. We also know, because I told you, that after the Spanish-American War, Roosevelt was elected governor of New York, right? We also know that he was elected vice president of the United States in 1900, and we also know that six months into McKinley's second term, he was assassinated and Roosevelt assumed the presidency. Now, what I will tell you that you'll find out later is after serving the remainder of McKinley's term, Roosevelt is going to be elected to his own term, in 1904, but we'll get to that when we get to the election of 1904. So what we'll start with for second period on Monday will be some things that happened during the uh, presidency of Roosevelt 
His re-election, his re-election again attempt had failed at the end of this material. So, second period students, yes, dear. Um, well, who was the person you wrote the profile on again? Uh, Thomas Hart Benton, who is a senator from Missouri. Okay. Um, two, Monday I have second period, Tuesday we have fifth period. So we'll continue on in those areas talking about the Roosevelt presidency and move from there. Just so you know, both classes are going to have a test Wednesday. And I'm going to be gone Wednesday. I got an appointment billing, so somebody will give you your test in the Commons Wednesday. It's a two it's a it's a bigger block period, member. And once your test is done, you'll have a video to watch or an AP assignment. I haven't decided yet. Video. Yeah, we'll see. But anyway, that's the plan. You will have a test for sure next Wednesday. Both periods.